if your data is valuable and it's yours, and we have this thing called property rights, which have been established in most parts of the world, that's that's yours. That's yours. Yeah. Um, and even if you do nothing with it, you should have the say whether you share it with somebody else. You should have the say what's done with it. And if it's valuable, maybe you should share in the in the value. It's about control. And I think that's a really important thing. The user has to be put back in control. The web to date was disproportionately about other interests and not about the user, not about the people, you, me, surfing the web. Um, so we've got to get that balance right. Swissborg. 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 Swissborg is sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the market. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, someone with incredible intellect, Des Martin, head of marketing at Brave, tons of cool stuff. One of the companies with the most adoption in the crypto space as of today. So we're in it for a great ride. Thank you so much for coming today, Des. Thank you, Alex. Good thank to be here. Thank you so much for coming here. And Des, we're just talking about your story a little bit and about how you transitioned into the crypto space. If you don't mind sharing yeah, that crazy sure. adventure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> happy to. Um, so it's one of these things that uh, it's it kind of gradually and then all at once, right? So i um, this friend of mine mentioned this concept of digital scarcity and I was like, digital scarcity? Um, but he posed a question and it's that Bitcoin is the most scarce asset in the known universe. And I'm like, no, it's not. There's, there's definitely other trace metals or elements. But actually, you know, even stuff that is on very tiny amounts on Earth is relatively abundant across the universe. In the known universe, the thing that is most scarce that we know of uh, is Bitcoin. And, you know, there's a finite amount and it's going to be very difficult to change that amount. Not impossible, mind you, but it's going to be very difficult to change that 21 or so million. Um, not so with other coins in crypto. Some might catch up in time, but it is a scarce resource. And then when you start thinking about it, you go, well, why does that matter? What, what does that play into anything? But, but it, it matters because we live in a world where governments can inflate, you know, and print money and... and and, and the history of the world suggests that when something is scarce, be it, you know, shells or yap stones or gold, over time, people put their wealth, it becomes a store of value. The most scarce, the hardest asset, the hardest currency is where people want to store their wealth. And if, once you get your head around that, you go, well, it's only a matter of time. Uh, it might be 10 years, it might be 20 years, but people are going to gravitate towards the scarcest resource. We've always done it. It's actually pretty... It, pretty you know it's not revolutionary it's it's a human trait um and once i came to that conclusion it was like okay wow i gotta pay attention i gotta put some time and energy into really understanding this and then and, and then you open up pandora's box right you go down this rabbit hole of different cryptos and um i've seen many different waves of um you know we had all the various different kind of uh, forked coins and, and new coins and all sorts of Mickey Mouse coin. And then we had all the ICOs and we had that explosion. Yeah. Now we have DeFi. DeFi, oh my um, God, yeah. And we can talk about DeFi yeah. maybe at some point because that's yeah. kind of interesting. Um, but uh, all of those things, and you know, you've got to take everything with a healthy degree of skepticism, particularly in the crypto space. But there was some fascinating things happen and uh, happening in there. And it's, it's, it's invigorating. And when I 
the more I learned about it, I was like, I'm going to work in this space. I'm going to make a difference in this space. And working for Brave and having a chance to see us grow and being the person behind, you know, our user growth and being the, the number go up guy, which is like, you know, every month did the number go up. Yes, it did. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, but I, you know, we want that. You know, that, yeah. that's I want that. There's, a, there's a, an energy in doing that. Um, and I suppose that's that's how I ended up in crypto. That's how I ended up where I am now. That's so fascinating. And I just want to follow up really quickly on what you just said. Now you talked about the ICO craze and now the DeFi movement. Uh, a lot of headlines are talking about how DeFi is entering a bubble. It's being kind of stretched. Some people compare it with .com, you know, any company yeah. .com. Is that how you see it at the moment? Or obviously it's, it has great intentions, great philosophy think, or? Even the people who are making money in DeFi call it a bubble, right? Everybody, <laughs> I think everybody I've spoken to about it is it's a bit of a bubble. But everything you have to pair back and see well, what's real. And there are some really interesting things. Ave, compound, curve. Um, I'm like, hmm, there's there's some stuff here that's that's tangible. But the, you know, I, I took 10 grand and I turned it into a million quid in a month by leveraging my positions all over the place and buying yam, sushi, kimchi, this, this, that, this, this, <laughs> and basically having a vegetable patch. Like, I, 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 I question that, right? Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I have to admit, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, you know, procured all those vegetables. I don't know exactly how, all the uh, the leverage and, and stretching you could do on top of that. But I, 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 as with anything, and unfortunately, generally with any sort of bubble, there is something solid in yeah, there. There is exactly, something legit, exactly. but everybody gets carried away. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think we're seeing that. Um, but I, I, I think banks are dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. I think banks are dinosaurs. And I think the idea that you can replace a lot of lending with with a new digital format, I think makes sense. But I don't think it's going to happen in the next two months. And I don't think it's going to happen in the way it's it's being portrayed in some of the DeFi circles. Ah, that's perfectly said. I couldn't have summarized it better. And I think you, you said like those projects that are surfacing that will end up surfacing. It reminds me a little bit of the FANG stocks, right? Like yeah. out of all the... The rubbish, there's a Facebook, Amazon, yeah. Google, and Netflix. There's some legitimate yeah. projects like you mentioned, Ave Compound. But like surface. every big tech revolution, and, and that goes back to railroads, that goes back to telecoms, that goes back to the dot com. You have this Cambrian explosion of people trying yeah. stuff. And you actually have to have like a thousand failures for one or two really big successes because yeah. people fail and learn and share and, and, and you get, you know, people, you know, pulling a fast one or whatever else. But all of that coalesces to creating enough energy. It's almost like the the booster rockets on a, or the you know, booster engines on a rocket. And they just, yeah. it lifts up a small number of players, but they get to, you know, they get to change the the, the world maybe. Wow. They get to change the the market at least and, and, and that ecosystem. That's fascinating. And I have to bring up the interview you had at Real Vision. Uh, what an awesome interview talking about internet 3.0, the decentralized web. You had so many fasc fascinating perspectives. And I have to ask you, Des, like, could you tell us or answer the question of who owns the internet? Like, that was such a cool, cool topic. Yeah. Um, well, so it's, it's a great question. And let's just try to unpack it a little bit and try and... Um, uh, so there's a strange thing that happens, right? When you're on the web, because we're on it every day and because we're on it many times a day, maybe even a hundred times a day when you count checking your phone and doing different things, we kind of have this like, um, I call it like the boil frog syndrome. So over time, the web is changing. The web is very different from what it was 20 years ago. It's a different thing. Um, but because we're in it all the time, we haven't really noticed that change. And the question of who owns the internet well, we all assume that we own our own internet experience. We own the thing that we do. Um, but when you start to pare back the layers, you see that, you know, it, there's a lot more going on. So uh, the way I like to, to, to look at it is to take a, you know, go back in a time machine and go back to 1994, the world's first ever banner ad, which was for Hot Wired, um, which was the online version of Wired magazine. And... Um, that was a pretty innocuous banner ad. It didn't even have AT&T branding on it. Um, it was uh, it just a, you know, click here. It had 44% click through rate. It was, um, uh, you know, at that time was a huge success and it paved the way for online advertising. But online advertising was not the same as advertising in a newspaper. Pretty quickly. It started out that way, which was content ad. But pretty soon, the costs and the amount people would pay for ads started to drop and drop. So those ads had to evolve. 
and they started to become things that profiled people that surf the web and, and gather information and track people. And um, behind that built up this huge ad tech ecosystem, currently valued at about 330 billion. So there was this massive industry that is built around um, collecting your information as you surf the web. There's a fascinating thing happens that most people don't realize. When you go to any of the popular media sites or any of the, 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 the main sites that people visit, as soon as you land on the page, a bidding war happens with many different exchanges and brokers where they are trying to understand, can they identify you? And if they can't identify you, how much do they know about you and how much will they pay for you? Um, and that's all happening in the background. It happens in milliseconds. And then a, a series of ads are delivered and you see those ads within the page. Um, I, I, but the, the, the underlying thing and the thing that people are waking up to is that all of this data that's being collected, all of this information, who, who owns that? And that goes back to your question of who owns the internet? Because if people and, and corporations and, and, and third parties, we don't even understand who they are, are gathering all this information, they get more and more control. And that control bills and bills. Um, and, and the user suffers. And the advertiser suffers. And the publisher suffers. It's a pretty broken system. And again, like I say, because we are using it every day and because we are kind of skating along the surface, we don't really think about these broken things that sit below. And the tragedy is that, you know, the original pioneers of the web had a very different vision. In their mind, there was going to be a chance for people to come together and to, to, to use this as a resource to, to, to grow and to share ideas across the globe. But it's been captured by a few really big players. And, and as each of us interacts, um, you know, it's starting to look like and it's starting to get to the point where we're actually giving away maybe more than we're getting. I know that seems extreme because we get some fantastic things from the web but we're giving away a lot. Um, and, and it's not just what we're giving away now. That data, that information about you that's floating around, it's there forever. Potentially, we, we think it's there forever, unless something happens. That information is, is, is there. And, and, you know, we've seen Cambridge Analytica. We've seen elections can be potentially, you know, that you, you can use that data to influence groups of people. Um, so what I mean about the price is that the price is not just to now, it's also into the future. What can be done with that? Um, so to the question of who owns <laughs> who owns the internet, um, it's not clear. It, it's, it's you know, there, there, is, there is a war for your attention, for everybody's attention. Everybody that's on the web, there is like these auctions I mentioned, these, these um, you know, there, there are popular websites have up to, you know, 150 trackers, maybe more, um, cookies, scripts, things executing in the background. And that is all to gather as much information about you as possible. So you're building up this, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a surveillance economy. And because we, you know, just go about our business, we've kind of shut it out. We've ignored it. And, and it's one of the core problems of the web. And hopefully, hopefully we can get to a point where um, there are new solutions and new things that will help us steer away from that. So nicely put. It's just, I'm starting to realize how messed up this really is. Thank you so much for enlightening me in all, on all those topics. Is identity or personal data ownership the most important, is, is that the most important thing when it comes to the internet of value or internet 3.0 in your opinion? Or um, are there other, like- well, I suppose that there, there are two things. I think the internet, I think internet 3.0 is still being defined. So I think there's lots of different definitions of what internet 3.0 is. Um, but I think the first thing is having a web where everybody fire hoses personal information all over the place is not good. Apple brought out a fantastic ad about privacy and it has different people. One woman is walking around whispering her passwords in everybody's ear. Another guy is shouting out his vital stats from, um, uh, fr from different exercise apps and stuff uh, around the place. Other people's personal conversations are getting shared. Um, but th that stuff does matter. Like it, it, it really does. So, so the private component is, is, is important because without it, society goes in really strange directions. And we're sitting here now, I want to say, hopefully towards the end of a pandemic, maybe we're in the middle of, you know, maybe there'll be another phase, but it's really shaken some parts of society a little bit. And I think, I think it's shown the need for us to, to really respect uh, people's privacy. Because if, if, if you don't do it, you know, in, in, the, in the world of bricks and mortar, 
we don't go around listening to everybody's conversations and we shouldn't do that in, in the online world. Um, so then we come to where does this go? And, and you have this um, loosely kind of web three. Um, and, and really, if your data is valuable and it's yours, and we have this thing called property rights, which have been established in most parts of the world, that's that's yours. That's yours. Yeah, um, yeah. And even if you do nothing with it, you should have the say whether you share it with somebody else. You should have the say what's done with it. And if it's valuable, maybe you should share in the in the value. Um, or, or, you know, you can it, 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 it's about control. And I think that's a really important thing. The user has to be put back in control. The web to date was disproportionately about other interests and not about the user, not about the people you, me surfing the web. Um, so we've got to get that balance right. That's a really nice answer. And so you said it's about control of your data, personal data. Some people like to call the internet a money as in you're being able to use this as a transfer, a system of money and monetary. Is that also one of the key components of being able to send over money in a decentralized way, et cetera, like Bitcoin as the definition of the internet 3.0? Because you said you're still visiting these things yes. at the time. Well, yeah. I think, well, it definitely. So with Bitcoin, it's, you know, not your keys, not your coins, right? So like you can take self-custody of your money which is something that unless you have bars of gold under your bed or unless you have, and even, even cash, they can turn around and say, eh, yeah. <laughs> we changed it. It's yeah. a new, you know, so, and leaving money in a bank, it's not, you don't have the custody level. Um, so uh, yes, Bitcoin has introduced that, you know, ownership of your own money and, and censorship resistant money. Um, and, and many other coins have taken that even a step further. And I think some of the privacy coins are interesting. Your Zcash and your Monero, um, because, you know, if you take that privacy example, you know, you need to have a next iteration. And Bitcoin will probably add some of those features in time. Um, although Bitcoin is quite slow to evolve, which is a pro and a con uh, to it. That's really, really interesting. Yeah, I'd love to see what this Internet 3.0 is going to be eventually further down the road. But you mentioned so many problems when it comes to data, when it comes to you know privacy, when it comes to being manipulated, brainwashed for these elections. So what really attracted you with regards to Brave? You know, what, yeah. what is the solution? Uh, what are some of the problems that Brave is really looking to solve at this point? You know, the Internet has evolved quite a lot. And some of the things that have grown up over the last while, the Internet's become bloated you go from page to page it's slow there's clutter um uh, people don't realize but all these scripts i mentioned that are downloading in the background they're chewing up your battery they're charging you more in data costs and then you have the privacy thing i've just mentioned so all of these uh things are, are really substantial and they're a real broken part of the web and, and that's what brave wants to fix and by the way, guys, for those watching, we're actually using the Brave browser here. Uh, you can see that we can play videos on YouTube without getting all those annoying ads. And it works on the phone as well, right? Awesome. Yeah, it's on all <laughs> devices. So you've got it on, on iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux, the whole shooting match. It's so, so convenient. And I, I really love it. It's so easy to use. It's just a browser and you can choose exactly the settings you want, what you want to share, what not. So, uh, and you guys have hit 18 million yes, users. Yes, as of um, August uh, 2020. So yeah, we've had 18 million uh, monthly active users and 6.1 million daily active users. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, Joe um, Rogan as well, Tim Ferriss, yes, some big um, names. <laughs> so yeah, um, we got a, a shout out from Jim Rogan, uh, sorry, from Joe, Joe Rogan, Rogan. Um, uh, a couple of months back, which is great. You know, he's saying he uses Brave. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're lucky. The, we, are, we are in the right place at the right time. This, this, there's a cross section of things, but people are waking up to some of the challenges of the internet. And they realize that if you switch to Brave, you don't compromise. You just get a faster, cleaner web. So it's not even a chore. So, you know, that's, that's it's a nice place to be. And, and my role at Brave is head of growth. So I just got to make sure people keep realizing and, and, and understanding this. And it's... Um, it's fun. It's a fun place to be. And it's it's great to see it grow. I love it. So far, my user experience has been really, really good. So what if my grandma Susie was here, Des? Like, how would you explain Brave in the most simplest way? OK, so Brave is a next generation web browser. So um, one of the great things about Brave is that when you bring all the privacy stuff that we've mentioned, so you can tell your aunt, your aunt Susie that no one's looking over her shoulder, no one's keeping tabs on her. But one of the benefits of that is that as you cut out all of that stuff, you get this faster, cleaner experience. Um, you just mentioned with YouTube, there's a whole range of things where you just get a clutter-free experience. And on top of that, we put a wallet in the browser. So we call it Brave Rewards. And if you choose to, and this is completely opt-in, 
you can um, receive uh, ads on Brave. And these are privacy respecting ads, which is a really important distinction. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But with our privacy respecting ads, you get paid for your attention. So you get to, first of all, maintain complete ownership of your personal data and you get to share in the value of that data. So you will get served privacy respecting ads. You'll be able to earn what we call basic attention tokens. And you can then decide where you want to uh, spend those or where you want to use those. Um, but just to explain privacy respecting ads, because this is a key concept for Brave. Um, generally speaking, and I, I mentioned this earlier, when you're served an ad, your personal information is sucked up. So your, your browser is like a, a Hoover. It's like a vacuum tube that's sucking up all of your data and sharing with these third parties. So your information is out all over the web. But with Brave, your personal information never leaves the device. So your, your, your laptop, your mobile phone, your information stays on device. And the ad catalog comes to you. So we bring an ad catalog that um, is connected to your device, gets downloaded at regular intervals, uh, usually daily, usually when you're on uh, Wi-Fi. And uh, you're able to get local matching. So the matching of the ad and the personal information happens on your device. It happens at what's called the edge. Um, so that that is a uh, th that simple sounding thing, but it's pretty revolutionary because it means that advertisers can reach somebody in a private setting. Um, users can consume ads and share in the value and, and users, if they choose to, can reward publishers with the uh, with, with the tokens they've earned. So it's a whole new digital economy. We're called Brave for a reason. We're encouraging this next wave of people who want to, you know, be the pioneers, be the people who create a change in the web. And just by using Brave, you create that change. You, you, you're, you're, you're bringing about a new economy, a private economy, a chance to do things differently. So yeah, be brave. So well said, you know, so I just tell my grandma, Susie, hey grandma, no one's gonna peek over your shoulder. Plus you can get rewarded for watching ads that are custom for you. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and it's a faster, cleaner experience. And it's a faster, cleaner experience. Yes. And to be yeah, honest- I, That's what I should have said. <laughs> I think it was slightly more long-winded, but No, yes. no, 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 it's good. Yeah. You give all the details, right? Yeah. So that, that's really interesting. And, you know, I must say as a user myself on both mobile and desktop, uh, it's super simple, right? And even the wallet is just a click on the side. It's very easy to set the, the rewards. Yeah. So very, very easy. So I'm very happy and I hope people out there will keep using this to change, be a part of this movement, which you're saying about people who care about their yeah. data. Yeah, well, the way I, I think about this, we're on the journey to 100 million users and hopefully more. 18 million now, but uh, you know, already we're having an impact, but at, at 100 million users, you know, there's a cohort of people who want a different web. And then ultimately the web will form and change around those people. And we can see a better, a better web. The web is one of the most important resources we have and, and it should be, it should be for everybody. And it should be a resource that enhances people's lives. And you know, one thing that really bothers me, Des, in the crypto space is a lot of people believe that everything is purely speculative, that it has no value, that has no use cases, real world use cases. And I think the BAT, the basic attention token is really one of those tokens that has not, you just mentioned economics within, but real utility. Is that, is that how you like to see things or? Yeah, so we like to think of the, the, the BAT as almost like kind of frequent flyer miles. So as you, um, you know, opt in to our ads, you get rewarded, you're building up these tokens. And now we have over 800,000 Brave verified publishers. You can tip or auto donate to any of those. So there's a real tangible benefit. We've got Wikipedia on board. They're getting substantial amounts every month. So there's a real ecosystem growing and there's there's transactions happening within that. But that's only the beginning. And, and we want people to have real, you know, to, to have more and more tangible utility. So take your attention, transform it into basic attention tokens, and then be able to buy a whole lot of things online that people would usually use their credit card for. Um, accessing content, accessing a whole range of largely online services, um, but we're pretty excited about it. Um, uh, you know, and, and stay tuned. There'll be some, that some sounds so I'm on that coming up over the next while. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to hear more about that. Is that kind of like the, the future for the, the BAT in terms of utility, using it, spending it, uh, in, in different kind of platforms. Is that where yes, you see it well, going? Well, the key thing, and this is laid out in the white paper, is for people to be able to transform their attention into something tangible and then be able to, uh, to, to get utility on the back of it. So when you think about that, there's many things across the web. And one of the things, I, I certainly find it, but when I have to take out my credit card online, the friction point is really high. There's a lot of smaller payments where if it was like, if I could just one click with a wallet that I have and, 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 
a veil of a VPN or something like that. It's it's a really nice, uh, you know, solution. It's a really nice fix. It really is. And I'm looking so forward to this. You know, the, the Brave browser, the BAT token, I think is a real reference in this space and brings a lot of credibility. So thank you so much for your hard work. Des, I know you're very active on LinkedIn and Twitter as well yes, these days. Or that's correct, yeah. If we want to follow you, like where, where should we go? And Yeah, sure. Well, on Twitter, um, on at uh, D-E-S-S-I-E underscore Martin. That's at Desi Martin. Um, and yeah, on, on, on LinkedIn, um, please feel free. Just shoot me a message. Um, you'll find me, Des Martin at uh, Brave. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And guys, if you like this episode today, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and blast that bell notification to get access to these timeless interviews with the greatest minds in the crypto space so that we can keep learning, learning, and evolving together as one community. Thank you so much for watching. Join us again next Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock UK time. See you next week, guys.